Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again. It's a Wednesday at 4 o'clock Eastern Time, and for the last few years, that means, that means it's time for Hot Technologies. That's right. This is our show with our friends Techopedia, techopedia.com. Check them out online. They get monster traffic, 1.5 million unique visitors a month. That's a lot of web traffic. The topic today, the DBA's dream discovery and management across the environment. Yes, indeed. It's a big issue, especially for larger organizations. There's a slide about yours truly and enough about me. Hit me up on Twitter at Eric underscore Kavanaugh. I always try to follow back and engage in conversation out there. So, again, we're talking about database technologies today and really being able to understand what's going on across a wide landscape of database instances. Uh, as many of you know, once you start growing your organization, you get many more of these instances out there. And keeping a handle on that stuff can be a bit of an interesting challenge. In fact, I remember a number of years ago I had a great conversation with a guy who was the – he's the head of data governance for – director of data governance for the CIO's office at the Department of Defense. And I was telling him all these interesting things. We had this great conversation, and I told him my background story about lobbying for transparency and federal spending. And he laughed, and he said, oh, so it's your house where I should send that next predator drone strike. He said, transparency and federal spending? I don't even know how many Oracle licenses I have around here. And when I heard that, I really could appreciate the magnitude of the challenge that some organizations face. Now, these days, there are lots of very interesting tools. We hear about one today for understanding what's flying around out there. But even 20 years ago, that was a really serious challenge. So when it comes to organizations the size of DOD, you can just imagine that getting a handle on that is going to save a lot of money. It's going to save a lot of time. It's going to solve some governance problems. You, you wind up solving multiple challenges all at once if you do this sort of thing correctly. So we'll learn about that today. We have our own Dr. Robin Bloron, Chief Analyst of the Bloor Group. We have Des Blanchfield, our data scientist, calling in from down under, Sydney, Australia, and Bin Chow, Senior Product Manager of IDERA, is on the line as well. So we do hot tech as the hashtag. Feel free to tweet away during the show. And uh, we do rely on you guys for good questions, so please don't be shy. Ask questions anytime using the Q&A component of your webcast console or that chat window either way. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Robin Bloor. Let me hand him the keys to the WebEx. There it goes, and take it away. Okay, well, here we go. Let's move on to um, the first slide. Um, uh, they in, initially, they called them Stanley O and Olio, um, Laurel and Hardy. The um, it was a surprise back in um, the 1990s when everybody was worried about the year 2000. Um, I got involved in a number of year 2000 projects, and I went to a, um, well, let's call them a large insurance company, and um, they discovered that they had over 500 applications that they didn't know existed on the mainframe. They were taking an inventory of the mainframe. Well, in those days, mainframe environments were far better looked after than anything that came later. I mean, there's just no question about it. So I was really, really kind of stunned. And I talked to um, uh, people at the organization, and they said there was no central comprehensive, um, there was no person responsible for knowing that information, you know, basically. They never took inventories of their assets. Um, and, you know, a database is an asset in no uncertain terms because it contains data and data is valuable. Um, so, how many instances is the question and actually where are they? Um, just This is just what is a database. Um, and the reason, you know, the reason I think like that, databases are covers into which you throw data. And I was talking to um, a site recently that had a thousand of um, instances of Oracle. Well, Oracle's uh, a database that um, uh, if you use it in any sophisticated way, it requires a DBA. Um, so I kind of asked about that, and they said they had about, um, I think it's about seven or eight DBAs uh, in the whole organization. They said, well, you know, 
who's looking after the other thousands of instances? And, and they said, well, really, what's happened there is that um, is that people are just using it as a file system. So we have a number of databases which are on large clusters where performance really matters. And they have DBAs that are standing over them all of the time. And then we have thousands of other databases that um, nobody um, uh, is looking after at all. And I did ask them exactly how many databases, and they came up with the, well, the last time Oracle audited it, <laughs> they didn't do audits themselves. You know, that was kind of an interesting thing. But, you know, there are reasons for using a database. A database implements a data model. It's there for sharing data, um, can manage multiple concurrent requests for data, implements a security model, is ASIC compliant, uh, is resilient, or can be set up to be resilient. You know, that's the reason that we have databases. Um, but, you know, it's not unusual to encounter sites with thousands of instances of SQL Server or Oracle, and um, most of them have not been, are just being used as file systems, basically. And so why would you create a new instance, really? Um, I know of um, developers, developer teams that if they're building a new application, they build it in a silo. So any given new application would have a separate database. They wouldn't necessarily be trying to make a data layer out of things. I don't think that's good practice, but there again, you know, if you've got a very complicated environment, it becomes very, very difficult to try and put together all of the um, databases that are related to one another in terms of having data within them where there are relations. Um, instances get, cre uh, get created for replicas. Um, you know, you can have hot standbys uh, or replicas for availability purposes, but you also have replicas or semi-replicas in data marts. And, you know, once the data warehouse world was introduced, um, the question of, you know, how many data marts were out there, and people were just using them as clone files, taking, uh, taking data out of um, the data warehouse and not particularly caring um, uh, about its performance in the sense that they would just make do as default performance. Most of these people probably didn't even know that you could actually tune databases. Um, I've seen um, designs that have sharded data um, into distinctive heaps um, for the purpose of um, uh, distribution. You know, you, you often get this replication situation where you've got multiple depots within an organization and they've got they've each got databases and each is a shard of a central database. So you get number you get instances from sharding. Um poor design decisions. I've seen some really bizarre designs take place in terms of databases where people have actually created um separate databases for no good reason. Um, and as I've noted, database is a file system. And then there are tests and development environments that need to be stood up and pulled down. But they all count as database instances. Uh, and all of them, by the way, need to have security and all of the other stuff that database hopefully provides. Um, uh, instance considerations. A database workload can only be optimized for a specific instance. If, you, if you're really interested in, in having absolutely the best performance, then having data sharded uh, off in loads of different databases um, isn't necessarily going to give you um, uh, that kind of optimi uh, optimization. So, you know, there's a, there's a reason not to create spurious instances of data. Um, Mixed workloads on the same database, this is the counterpoint, can lead to poor performance, it's particularly noted, but notable by OLTP and um, uh, large query traffic simply don't mix, never have mixed and probably never will mix. Um, it's usually best to consolidate a database at the server level uh, rather than having multiple VMs. 
Um, but VMs provide isolation. Some people, with some people, it's a design decision to isolate data from other data so that, you know, um, if that application fails, or if that database fails, it doesn't bring my application down. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that you end up running into the next point, which is database, li database license fees. Those vary, but um, I've seen database license fees become a design criterion because somebody didn't want to burst a particular number, and therefore people de designing um, systems poorly um, simply because of the way that the, the um, database license works. Um, and there's the other thing, if you start to consolidate all your databases, it is worth noting that DBAs are expensive. So that's not such an easy thing to do. Um, simple view of the world, and this is the last slide really. There's a data layer, there's a transport layer, and there's a processing layer, and all of the hardware sits underneath that. Um, it isn't really possible to optimize the data layer without knowing exactly what's in it and why. And having said that, I shall pass on to my friend from down under, Des Blanchfield. Thank you, Robin. Let me just uh, get my mouse sorted out here. So I'm going to give us a couple of anecdotes today because this is a huge uh, topic and I could spend two weeks uh, on a whiteboard with a whiteboard mark having fun about it because uh, I've had a, <clears throat> nearly three decades of, uh, of uh, ups and downs in this space. Um, but first, a mental visual picture. Um, when I think about the challenge that we're talking about today, and, and essentially we're talking about uh, database growth, replication, and sprawl, and all the challenges that come with that, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to just put this picture of a giant oak in our mind. Um, these are famously beautiful trees. They start out as a tiny acorn, but they grow to these behemoths. And when they do so, they're very big and messy. And as you can see from this image, um, as a visual metaphor, if you like, um, you know, branches going everywhere and then, and then, you know, twigs coming off those and leaves at the end of those and they're in all kinds of random chaotic shapes. And that's just the bit we can see above the ground. So I kind of think of those as, um, as data inside the database. And then below that, there's a structure of, of roots and they tap into all kinds of directions, but it seems very clean and sensible uh, at the surface of the ground there where it's nice and flat, but the reality is it's just as crazy under the ground as it is above the ground, we just don't see it. And I often kind of use this uh, when I start thinking about how to describe uh, the challenge we're talking about today to organizations from the boardroom down to the techies to try and get them to visualize what's actually happening in their organizations because it's so easy to look at a computer screen and see these beautiful fields or rows and columns and think, meh, we've got it sorted out, it's no big deal. But that isn't the case at all. Um, and so to that point, um, yeah, I usually hit this one liner saying that databases, in my mind, are like acorns. You know, they start small and grow, but before you know it, you've got a forest of giant oak trees, uh, and hence the visual. So two anecdotes just to share um, a scenario that grew out of control and, and just couldn't be fixed, and then another one that uh, did a similar thing but was able to be fixed, and I will, I will highlight the key point of today's discussion around how we can about it. So the first one was a, a scenario where a CIO with the greatest of intentions um, over time unwittingly caused one of the most unexpected and unwanted, unwanted database sprawls uh, that just grew beyond control. Um, it was a scenario where a government organization with thousands of staff, very technically savvy staff, um, were demanding access to systems and, and tools that they could start to collaborate with and, and automate a lot of their processes. They want to get away from paper forms. They want to create online systems. They want to capture data and track it, monitor it, and report it back and present it back to the, their peers. And these are all kinds of things. There's things from uh, people turning up to their offices and, and clocking in and, and signing in for uh, security purposes all the way through to who was ordering what at the cafeteria at lunchtime. And so a well-intentioned CIO decided that Lotus Notes was a great idea because they'd been to a series of seminars and IBM had done a great job of pitching it. And in the right scenario, it would have been a great decision uh, had it been done under control. But what happened was instead of handing Lotus Notes to a, a team of technical people to sort of implement an environment and then stand up sensible tools and so forth and provide some control and governance around it, what actually happened is it got deployed to the standard operating environment, the SOE. And so every desktop effectively became a server and so they provided training and hands-on notes and documentation of this whole process. 
And all of a sudden people realize, yay, I've got Lotus Notes on my desktop. What does this mean, you think? Well, it meant that thousands of very technically savvy staff were taught how to script and write apps effectively in Lotus Notes, create little databases, which essentially look like spreadsheets, rows and columns and fields, and present these with a web interface through Domino. So that if I wanted to capture information about something, I could just create a little form in a spreadsheet type interface, uh, put it into a file, create a little Lotus Notes database uh, behind it, and present it as a web app and start collecting information. And that sounded great until it had been running for years. And all of a sudden, they realized that uh, someone woke up and said, well, hang on, why are there 10,000 new database-powered apps appearing up on the land, and particularly in the last 12 months? What's going on? Well, what happened was, you know, you essentially gave people a, a gun and it was loaded and the safety was off and of course they shot themselves in the foot. And there's this great image here that, um, that, that, that I uh, usually conjure up in my mind of a, an Italian artist who does this weird thing where he gets a, a truckload of hay and straw and dumped into the middle of an art studio and then gets a curator of the art studio to randomly shove a needle into the middle of it and then he spends days on live feed on camera going through the straw looking for the needle in the haystack, as it were, uh, until eventually after hours or days he finds this and jumps up and down and gets excited. Um, and anyway, Italian artists, what can you do? Um, but it's quite humorous, and if you've ever watched it online or if you do watch it online, you'll find it very cathartic. So here's a nightmare scenario where a well-intentioned technical person gave business people, very technically savvy business people, a tool that was supposed to make their lives easier. But before long, we had questions like, well, who's backing them up? Who's monitoring and supporting them? Where is this data? What structures are data in? Who's policing the schemas? Um, what if I want to create another version? What data is in those versions? Can I do a dev test integration uh, uh, journey on these things? You, you know, you can draw your own conclusions on how it went, but it didn't go well. And, and you can imagine that just hundreds of terabytes of data are not backed up, sitting on effectively PCs or laptops on desks. Some systems not even being available because people didn't realize when they shut their laptop off at uh, 5.30 and took it home to do work that no one on the land could get to that application. It, it didn't end well. And a great deal of data had to be cleaned up and, and manually manipulated and brought back into a sensible system. Majority of it was just wiped out and, and, and removed um, because it just couldn't be allowed to sprawl further. So then uh, my second anecdote uh, where things went on a very different journey. Um, Imagine a scenario, you've got dev, test, integration, systems integration, user acceptance testing, production, disaster recovery, backups and backup copy one through to 99 and beyond. You've got upgrades, patches, and then demonstration environments from one through to 99 and more. And all of a sudden you sit there going, wait, what, what's going on? Hang on, who's using what? You know, this is just, this is a nightmare potentially uh, waiting to happen. Uh, but in this scenario, what happened was uh, I had a, an opportunity to go into an organization who wanted to extract a wealth management business unit from their core banking platform and stand it up as a separate organization in, in essentially a startup within an, or, uh, an enterprise. So the, the, the challenge was take our wealth management business unit and all the people and technology and data around it and the products and services, and create a startup inside our own company and, and, and carve it off so it can run on its own brand. Um, so this is a global leader in banking, which I won't name. Um, we had to extract the wealth management business unit itself and all of the things around it, so everything in its entirety, all the staff, the physical infrastructure, move into a new office space, all the business systems, all the software, all the data, all the licensing, you name it. Well, you can imagine that, that looked like a bit of a nightmare to start out with. Uh, and to put some context around it, we're talking about 78 different systems in the original banking platform supporting about 14 core products, of which could be about 1,000 different offerings, hundreds and hundreds of live databases in use, uh, and when I say in use, we had to move them in situ. So on, on a Friday afternoon, they'd be in one environment. On Monday, they're expected to be somewhere else. And on Saturday and Sunday, they had to have this crossover where transactions went from one system on the left, let's say, to visualize it to another system on the right. About 15,000 customers with, with you know, just countless records each. Uh, and an ETL nightmare because none of the 78 systems on one side were matched by systems on the other side. We had completely new banking platform, new systems, new software, new databases, and new schema. So metadata, fields, rows, columns, records, tables, you name it, nothing matched. There are 14 different active uh, development teams, one for each product. Uh, and when we built this environment, we found that by the time we had dead test, de development test, integration, systems integration, user acceptance testing, production, disaster recovery, demonstration copies, backups, uh, upgrades patching, I even missed one there, training, for example, in education. 
there were 23 versions of each of these environments for each development team. Now you sit there and all of a sudden your blood starts to curdle and your skin goes cold and your hair stands and everything, that, that can never end well. Well, it turns out it ended out very well because the very first thing we did before we even started the technology uh, deployment and design was we went and got the right tools. And we used tools and not necessarily people, but people driving tools. We used tools to map the data. We used tools to map the databases they lived in. We mapped all the metadata, the schemas, all the way down to rows, columns, and records and fields. So we knew what we were coming from, and then we correlated that to the map of what we were putting in place as far as the off-the-shelf banking platform looked like. And we had a one-to-one -one correlation, and anything that fell off in the middle, we created a data room where we'd go through and manually map them. But prior to doing any deployment and any standing up of these environments on the new, new world, we made sure that every single record, every single table, every field, every row, every column, every database, and all the metadata around it, all the permissions and controls were mapped from one to one. And, and we didn't move a single thing until that correlation was made. And so the ETL piece went from being a nightmare to a, a fairly painless process of just validating uh, that controls and, and processes being followed. And we could do this on a regular basis. So almost hourly, we were doing transition from production in the old world to new environments of dev test integration, et cetera, in the new world. And on the day we went live after a five-month process to go, to go live after a month's worth of testing and then in six months it was online and active, we only had one issue. And the issue was that someone forgot their password and had to be reset. That was the only issue we had, and it essentially created about an hour of stress for people thinking something gone wrong. It turned out a password expired, and they forgot what it was, and we had to reset it. So you can imagine that scenario compared to the Lotus Notes environment where someone had great intentions but didn't think through the challenge, and next thing we had to go and try and map all this data, and the bulk of it was just having had to be written off, and it was just you know, a great loss of time and effort and, and resource and morale, to a scenario where when it's properly planned and properly done, and delivered appropriately with the right tools, we got a great outcome. And so that point uh, brings me to this one liner before I hand over to our uh, associate to talk about uh, what idea I have to solve this uh, very challenge, is that in today's world, um, where increasingly systems are powered by databases, um, it's, it's not just a nicety, but it's, it, it, to me it's a fact, it's a necessity, that smart tools are, in my experience, the only way to manage the data discovery, data management, and the scale and the speed that we're moving. And if it is done right, as the second anecdote there just shared, um, uh, hopefully uh, illustrated, it can be a very painless and very uh, seamless process, not just in new projects, but, but getting your, your, your arms around a current environment and ensuring that any time and day you can track and trace what's happening in your organization, what database is there, what version of the database is running, and who's using what. And to that end, I will hand over to our associates uh, from IDEA, and I look forward to hearing uh, uh, what they have to uh, offer on the table. And, uh, how they've solved this very challenge. Great. Right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Doug. Take it away. Can you guys can you guys hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. All right, thank you. Hi everyone. I'm uh, Ben Chow with IDERA. Um, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about a product that we have called SQL uh, Inventory Manager. Um, and it, it talks about the discovery and the ability to inventory um, your SQL Server instances and databases out there and to kind of uh, get, get a handle of what you have in the environment and kind of um, talk about some of the things that Des and Robin talked about in terms of, you know, database ball and the need for data um, these days. So with that, um, so here are some, some considerations that you've heard, I think, anecdotally through um, the, um, the two tells that Des um, was describing. Um, but basically today, there's so much need for data and business groups out there kind of spinning up their own applications and servers, um, particularly with SQL Server, right, because you can easily spin up a SQL Express version or BI services. Um, but there's, there's just SQL sprawl going on, at, you know, at many organizations, you know, from the, from the small to the, to the large. A lot of times DBAs are not aware that somebody decided to start, you know, create an instance rather than just putting a database on an existing instance. Um, they're not aware of these things until potentially if there's a problem, someone's calling the DBA and says, oh, no, my, my, you know, my application stopped working, it's not able to connect to the database, what's going on in the, you know, you know, when the DBA is asking some questions, or, you know, they've discovered, hey, this one wasn't on our radar, we, we weren't aware of it. 
Um, another one is um, licensing costs, right? So Microsoft um, SQL Server license, the way it works is um, you're not required to kind of have a specific key for that number of instances, right, that you have. Um, you can deploy and then they do an audit. Um, you know, they do an audit later and kind of discover how many how many licenses you actually need. Um, and then so if you're if during an audit and you're not aware of the unknown servers, it could, could result in kind of a costly audit. Um, and so having a tool or, or having an inventory ahead of time to know what your your licensing costs and being able to not only know but also manage it is a, is a good thing to have. Um, and then you know what I just talked about. You know, you're not a, if you're not aware of a server. A lot of times, um, people if things are running along fine, everything is fine. But the only time you're you know, you're made aware of something is when there's a problem, um, and so that could lead to production interruptions or maybe the server wasn't maintained and you didn't get a patch on that server and, and that creates a, 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 an issue. Um, so some of the questions uh, a DBA kind of have to do day to day that they face, you know, they, they can they could be administrative or strategic, but, you know, some things like, you know, Microsoft just released a critical system patch. How many systems do I know out there will need this new patch? Um, who's, who are, who's going to be impacted by, you know, downtime if I need to take the system down to patch it up? Do, you know, how can I easily get to that information? Do I have to go into a spreadsheet? Um, do I have to go into multiple systems to find that? Do I have to reach out to the different business groups to, you know, get that list? Um, so it's really hard to piecemeal it. Um, you, another one, another good one is basically, you know, someone come along and they say, hey, I need a new database. It's going to require X, you know, X size. It, it needs to have this much capacity, and then they want to know where can I put it. Um, without knowing what's in your landscape, it's hard to kind of tell them, okay, we can put it here, here, or here. You kind of have to go in and, you know, do your manual checks if needed to get that done. Um, you know, and the, we talked about the auditing, um, and then also the rogue server. So if you have a rogue server out there, you know, you don't know what state it in, it, what state it is in, whether it's been backed up, whether it has all its patches. Um, sometimes you may not, you know, become aware of those things until there's a problem, uh, which could be which could be bad. Um, so those are kind of all the, the challenges. And um, the DBA kind of face from a day to day um, what's thrown at them. Mm -hmm. So, so I wanted to introduce you to like SQL Inventory Manager, which is a product that we we have out there. Um, it does a couple of things. Um, it does discovery, which is basically kind of going out into your environment um, to kind of see what's what's out in your what what SQL Server out there in your environment. Um, and then it can also auto-discover. So basically, once you do run a discovery, you can set it to um, go out there daily or weekly, whatever time frame you like, to discover new instances out there. And then you can, all, you can also have it auto-register those instances so you can start monitoring them and check on their state of their health. Um, and then you can start cataloging and inventorying those um, Instances so that you can kind of see, have a good view of your um, of your uh, SQL Server landscape, what's out there, what's production, what's development, what uh, uh, what's disaster recovery, what's most critical, and what you know, who's, who's that, what applications are running on them. Um, and you can also get alerts when when things. Um, when the health check is feeling. So basically, the server is down, or you'll be able to fix that, as well as a number of additional things you can do to itself. You're getting a little bit soft, just so you know. Okay, sorry, is this better? Yep. So what I wanted to do is kind of take you guys through the demo, show you guys what it does. Um, so hang on a second here, let me pull that up. Oh, wait, sorry, let me share my screen first. Okay. 
Have you guys seen the um, yep. web interface? Okay, yep. Great. So this is this is the SQL Inventory Manager interface. Um, the screen that I'm showing you here, it's a web-based interface. The screen that I'm showing you here is um, is our database instance view. Um, and across the top, you can see that we've got different things that it can do. So discovered is basically all the instances that are discovered on the network. And what it's going to show me is starting to break up just a little bit there. You may want to put the phone down and put it on speaker. Go ahead. Okay, so is this better? Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, sorry. Uh, so this discovery screen will show you everything that um, that the job, the inventory managers discover on your network. So here it's discover like a thousand of three servers out there. And it will tell you the version, the addition, if it can find it, um, when it was discovered, and how it was discovered. If if I choose to, like let's say, for example, I choose to ignore some of these, meaning, you know, I know maybe I want to ignore the developer edition because they're not as important to me because they're, they're just developer edition. I can choose to ignore these, and it'll put on the ignore tab so that the next time that I run discovery, it's not going to show it to me again. Now I can select to auto do auto registration or I can manually register. And so here I have selected to, to monitor six instances. <coughs> and here it's logged in and it's doing, it's going to run periodic checks on these. And then there's multiple checks, anything varying from, you know, it checks every 30 seconds to see if the server is uh, up or down. And it gives you a kind of an overview of what that state is. So basically here it's telling me that I've got one server that's down and these five that are up. It's also telling me what server addition, the number of databases, the size of the databases, any additional inventory or metadata around that um, server. I can also get to the licensing view from here. So here it's giving me some of the Microsoft um, licensing information that I need if I wanted to, uh, you know, get ahead of getting a total or summary before a Microsoft audit. Um, so here it does the number of cores, it does the number of sockets, the possible core license, which was something that Microsoft introduced with, starting with 2012. Um, so that was our instance view, our overview page. Um, this is kind of the page that you will open up to. This will show you kind of the health checks, what recommendation it has. Like right now it's telling me I've got nine databases that do not have current backup. I can click in there to go down to the details to see which databases those are, and then I can go in and, and you know, take an action on them if I needed to. Um, it tells me also the top databases by size, top databases by activity. Um, I can click into the particular server and get more details about it. Sorry. Yeah, and while that's rolling, I mean, what you're showing us here is the ability to see really anything that's connected to the network, is that right? Right, so this, this is showing me anything that I have chosen to, uh, to monitor using Inventory Manager. Hmm. So this, and like, for, if this is a critical server, um, it shows me here like kind of all the application that's connected to the server, um, again, I can get in all the databases that are associated on the server. Over here, I could tag things. Um, like I could create a tag for this particular server, with, you know, whether or not it's a precise, precise domain to, on the precise domain. Um, we have customers that use it for like they want to tag their production servers or their dev servers, um, and then they can kind of get a, a full report of what things are, where things are. Um, 
if I go over to the administration tab, this is how I can run discovery. And discovery is basically, it's going to go out and run, um, run, go out onto your network and find all the, um, find all the um, SQL Server in your environment. So here I have this precise domain, which is a domain of ours. Um, and I set it up to say, you know, on this particular domain, use my use this particular Windows user account to do discovery, and I want you to do a complete scan. I can also select to specify, you know, a, only scan this particular um, subdomain, or you know, only scan scan the parent. Um, but in this case here, I said, you know, run the complete scan. Um, here are the different scan types I can use. And if I save that, and then basically it's a job that I can set. Um, right now it's off, meaning that I would have to manually run these scans. But if I wanted to, I can say let's set a daily, you know, run the job daily. Or if I choose not to run it daily too so much, I can say run the job weekly on a specific date and time. Um, and then auto registration here is basically it says if, it's, if this is turned on, what it would do is that every time it found a new server, it's going to automatically register it into inventory manager so that I can start monitoring it. If there are some sort of addition that I want to exclude, like for example, I don't care about Express or Developer Edition because those um, are development environments, then I would just pick those here and what it will do is it just says every time I found something new I'm going to add it to inventory manager so that you can monitor it as long as it's not a developer or an express edition. And here's where I can set the tags. So for example, uh, if I have production servers, I could go here and tag those servers. So I could tag either a database or a server. Um, with this particular tag. So, for example, I could say that this AO node should be a have a production tag. Um, and this way, if I needed to easily get to the server, I can. Um, I can go out here and I can go out here and click on that production tag, and it will take me right away to those two servers. It's taking me to the, this is our explore view, and it's just showing us, this is by owner, but I could say by instant uh, tag. Sorry, this is account. I could say by databases too, and tell me how many I have, and I can expand this to see what they are. Another useful um, feature that we feel that people really like here. Um, is the ability to look at your what you're managing through inventory manager and seeing what patch level they're at. So basically here it's telling me here are the six servers that I've got managed through my tool, um, whether or not there's an update available from Microsoft, um, and what's, you know, whether or not the version that I'm on, whether it's supported or not, um, and the support status. If I wanted to find out more about this particular hotfix, I can click on this. And it will link me out to the article um, from Microsoft in terms of what you know what that optics is about and what, what it addresses. Um, you can export this list if you wanted to, so that you know that way you can say, hey, I need to patch maybe three of these servers this weekend and the other three um, at a later date. Um, the bill list, so there's a list that it checks against to see that your version is up to date. Um, you can go out and download this list to make sure it's up to date and that you have the latest list to compare to. Another um, neat inventory feature that we've, um, that people like is the ability to add not only tags, but the ability to add custom inventory fields. So um, 
you know, if you wanted to add a field here to tag every day, to tag a database, for example, let's say I want to tag it at the database level, um, department, so the department owns this database. I could make it uh, a different type, open and yet yeah, true, false, or pick list. Um, and I could say, you know, is this, this is a HR marketing, uh, R&D, finance. Um, and what this goes to is basically once you, once you can tag these things, um, you can get some data out, um, out of here that says, you know, how much capacity each database is using, and then you can start to kind of, you know, see is it growing and whether or not, you know, it doesn't make sense to charge back these departments. Um, another thing is, you know, um, if you have to run maintenance by knowing who owned that database, you can know who to contact to, say, to let them know, hey, I've got to, I've got to run maintenance this weekend. Let me, you know, shut your, your databases will be offline, so on and so forth. Um, another useful feature is a search box up here people like. A lot of times DBAs are asked about um, a database or an application or a server, depending on who's talking to them, and so it's hard to figure out, you know, exactly where that's at. Um, what you could do here is you may not know where a database lives, um, but you can just type it in. So I could just type in the idea of the dashboard, because I know this one exists. <laughs> Um, and it's going to pull up, you know, a couple of databases and where they sit um, so that you can easily get to those. And then it pulls up additional information about them, you know, their size, the log size, whether or not it's ever had a backup, um, what the recovery mode it's in, if I wanted to add any tags about it. Um, So there's a lot of different features um, within this tool um, that's, you know, it's an inventory tool, but it's an inventory tool that's very specific to SQL Server um, and for DBAs, um, you know, because there's, I guess, additional things a DBA would like to, to have access to in order to kind of get a good view of what the environment um, and their landscape look like for their databases. Um, you can also subscribe, configure the SMTP server, and set up subscription to alerts uh, for yourself or for uh, any users on here. I'm going to stop this and go back to the presentation. Um, and this last slide here is just a simple um, view of the architecture. Um, it is a web console um, that runs on an embedded Tomcat web, web services. Um, we have some collection services and management services that we put into a repository. Um, and this management services goes out and runs discovery on your various SQL Server instances. There's nothing installed on your monitor servers. Um, we have jobs that run periodically that just collect data about it, so basically whether it's up or down, how much data is being used, what SQL Server versions are. Um, and that's, that's all. Yeah, let me ask you, I'll ask a couple questions that I'm sure Robin and Des have some as well. Um, just out of curiosity, like when someone comes in to do an audit, let's say Microsoft, are they using this tool or I presume they have some proprietary tools that they use? Yeah, I believe they're using a proprietary tool. Um, okay. the, thing is, the thing is, this tool is it's, it's an inventory tool, so it keeps it keeps up to date in terms of it's you know because it has those jobs to go out to continuously collect information about your your servers. Um, it's going to run out there, and at any point in time, you will have up to date information. In fact, about how things change versus you know one time report that you may get from Microsoft to say this is the number of server you have, these are the versions you have. Yeah, I'm curious about discovery. So when someone buys this tool and begins using it, how does how does the discovery actually happen? This was 
kind of what I was alluding to earlier. In other words, are you tapping the network to see which signals are flying out there that appear to be database instances, and then you catalog that, and then once you've tagged a, 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 a um, database instance that you're monitoring, it, I'm guessing it has a sort of ping that it does every so often, and if it goes down, for example, that's how you know it's down. Is that kind of how things work? Yeah, so, I mean, once you um, turn on discovery, it goes out to your network, and there's, we've got several different scans to go out there, but it does, you know, a browser scan and registry scan. Um, it does different scans to see what, what computer is out there, and then it does a check, do you have people server out there or BI services out there? Um, and then it brings it back and put, pulls it into the tool and shows it to you, hey, here's all the things that I've discovered. Uh, and then if you, if you select to say I want to monitor using this tool, then it's gonna it's gonna keep track of that and it's gonna ping it. And it has jobs to ping it every so often to say, okay, check this about the check this now about this thing. You know, the database availability. Check the, check it now about the database history. Check the database size. It runs a series of jobs to check your database that you're monitoring. Yeah, I know that's good. And uh, we have a question from an audience member. I know you guys have tools that work with a variety of database technologies, but this one in particular you're showing today, is this just for SQL Server or does this cover other database types too? Right now this particular tool covers SQL Server. Okay, that's fine. Well, let me turn it over to Robin. I'm sure he's got a couple questions and then maybe back over to Des. Robin? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Microsoft Valley recently, sometime in 2006, um, announced SQL Server um, on Linux. Um, but I don't think it's delivered it yet. I just wondered if you've got any comments on that. Have, are you aware of that? Are you playing with that? Uh, yes, we are. Um, we are planning um, to include that. I mean, so the, the nice thing about this tool is I've talked to a lot of customers that have built their own homegrown tools to kind of do the same thing, but they have to keep, keep up with the different, uh, the new additions and version that Microsoft comes out with. Um, but we, we, you know, as new version and addition, we get in on it early to make sure that the tool will, will be able to kind of monitor and manage um, the new addition. So SQL on Linux is something we plan to add um, and make available when it's available, um, I believe, later this year. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Are you expecting um, uh, a lot of your customers to actually do that? Um, I mean, it, it's SQL Server is a very sophisticated database in my experience. I mean, you know, it's um, long in the tooth is probably the thing to say. I mean, you know, the original Sybase that it came from was actually fairly um, simplistic in a lot of things it did. But um, Microsoft has added more and more stuff over the years. Is, is all of that going to be available on Linux? I mean, like, will you be advising um, your customers on whether to make that migration? Oh, sorry, the question, are we seeing people ask for that, or? Well, it, 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 given you've messed about with it, is it as sophisticated on Linux as it is on SQL Server, uh, on um, Windows? Um, I haven't played with it myself, but what I've heard um, from a colleague is that it's actually, you know, very, very on par, but I, I personally have not played with it. The, the new version okay. of SQL on Linux. Um, am I right in thinking that you simply put agents on every SQL Server instance you find? Is that how the, this tool works? Uh, no, we actually don't put agents. For this particular tool, the inventory piece, we don't actually put agents on there. Um, we just kind of go out and make a call um, and check statuses on it. One nice thing about this tool is that it is agentless. So you've got other SQL Server tools. Can you kind of remind me as to what other um, products you've got in this suite that deal with SQL Server? Yes, uh, we have SQL Diagnostic Manager. It's a monitoring and performance tool. Um, it does more in-depth uh, analysis of diagnostic and performance um, and health checks for you than, our, uh, than inventory manager. Inventory manager is a lightweight version of that uh, health check. 
Uh, we also have Compliance Manager and Secure, which is part of our security suite. Um, it will tell you basically um, who's accessing your data, what data are they accessing, why, and it, it, it's a, you know, it helps you with your compliance and auditing reporting guideline. We have SQL Safe, um, which is our backup tool. It does backup and restore, um, and it just does them nicely. Um, we also have our Enterprise Job Manager, which is um, which is a, it would just monitoring your job. Um, and then we have the toolbox tool, which are uh, admin tool sets um, and also comparison tool sets, as well as uh, SQL Doctor. Uh, admin tool set and comparison tool set, they are basically 24 kind of, they, they, they're what I think is a Swiss Army knife. Um, they have multiple tools in there to kind of help the DBA do various different things. Um, like, you know, check patches or uh, move or clone a database. Um, but there's 24 such tools in, in that toolbox. Well, so are, are the people that um, go for the inventory management, are they normally already users of your other tools? Or is this, is this a kind of an entry point? I mean, I can imagine, I mean, you can tell me if you've got any war stories, but I can imagine if you've never actually run um, an inventory on uh, a, in a, a fairly sizable data center, the um, the experience can be quite sobering. Is is that what you find? Uh, yes. I mean, I have we have customers that are introduced to this tool from our other tool set. Um, however, we have customers that come looking for a tool like this because of projects they, that they have. So um, one example I have was. There was a group, uh, a company that merged with another company, and they bought a series of companies and needed to consolidate their SQL Server footprint um, in order to reduce their costs. Um, and so they were looking for a tool to kind of go out and discover everything that they had so they can start the process of how do we consolidate this. Right. I understand. I mean, I guess that's quite common with mergers when you think about it. Okay, I mean, I'll hand on to Des. I want to take all the time. Um, see what see what questions we've got from Australia. Uh, thank you. Yes, the questions are always upside down here. W one of the first <laughs> things that comes to mind is, um, and and I, I get this quite a lot. You know, companies aren't quite sure where to draw the line as to when to start to invest. Where, when should an organisation, in your experience, given that you're at the cold face, when is the right time? to start investing in tools like this to ensure you don't get into trouble? Do you do it from day one when you start building your database infrastructure as a new organization or as you just outlined when you do a, an acquisition merger? Or is there a particular scale you really need to be at? Do you need 10, 100, 1,000 databases? What's your um, experience so far as far as the, the market you've been dealing with for, for so long? When's the right time to get into the space and, and, and probably you know, kind of where to start? What does it look like when you get started? I mean, I, I think maybe if it's a very small organization, you may not have a need for this tool. Like with one DBA and, you know, or a couple DBAs, but when you start to get a group of, I don't know, three to four DBAs and maybe 50 to 100 server, you may want to start doing something like this. I guess as your organization grows larger um, in size and just, you know, people with business people with tech savvy, you know, wanting to, you know, like that example that you gave, want to have install applications and databases on their own, that's, that's, that's when you want to have this kind of tool because that way you can kind of see what's out there. But even in a smaller organization, it, it's nice to have this type of a tool to kind of keep track of what you have um, as soon as you spin it up so that you can say, oh, yeah, this was, I bought this, I bought SQL 2012 for this box, but it's currently running SQL, 2008 because I have an application that still needs that legacy, you know, version. Um, so it right. helps to have that inventory tool just to kind of to get away from like managing multiple spreadsheets that, are, that can become stale. The um, yeah. the other question I had just following on that, um, what, it, what types of uh, skills or resources should organizations be planning to have when they do get to that scale? 
uh, is it the case that there's a particular skill set that you really need or a type of experience or background or the type of person that's best suited to this kind of challenge or, or is it something that the average DBA or, or sysadmin or network administrator type skill set could throw them out? You know, do you really need a, a sharp pointy ended brain or, or can, you, um, can you pick this up pretty quickly? Sorry, I, so you're talking about the skill set of a person? Yeah, so when you think about a database administrator, there's a particular set of skills that you would need. So when you go out hiring a, a DBA per se for that specific role, when you think about the types of challenges that you're talking about here, we're using a tool like this to, to keep on top of mapping and tracking databases, doing the discovery piece and driving this particular tool. Is there anything unique about the use of the tool and the approach to, to this type of challenge or is it something that, that the average DBA can pick up pretty quickly? Yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I mean, I think your average DBA can pick this up quickly. I think it's, it's helpful to have this type of a tool because you can also turn it around because it's web-based to give it to your, um, to, to other users within your organization. So you could give it to an app developer who can check on his, check on his particular database or server, um, you know, without, you know, it, it takes away some of the administrative things that a DBA have to do. Previously, someone would call up DBA and say, oh, why is my server up or down? Now they can kind of get access and see whether their servers are up or down. And what sort of environment uh, would an average organization need to deploy this? Uh, can, can it be done, I mean, does it need a dedicated physical server? Can it be done on a virtual machine? Can they deploy it into a cloud environment? Um, what, what's the general footprint for the deployment of the tool and, and, and just the general running of it? Um, how much heavy iron does it potentially need to run in, in, in parallel to the other environments it's mapping? Yeah, um, it, it can be run on your, it can be run um, on a VM or, or, um, or uh, a computer um, or a server, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a dedicated server. Uh, it just depends on how many servers you're monitoring. Um, if you have a larger environment, it may help to have a, 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 a larger server just so that it, because it's, co it's collecting a lot of data about the SQL server that you're monitoring. Um, right. Is it the sort of thing you could comfortably run in a cloud instance and create a VPN back to your environment, or is, is the amount of data it's collecting probably a bit heavy for that type of use? And we, we have not set it up to run it onto the cloud, to run this in the cloud yet. Right. So that should run natively. Yeah, it should, be, it should probably be run on-prem. And the last question for me, if I can, um, you know, a lot of the tools that I've seen in this space, uh, particularly where you, you mentioned before one, one scenario where if one acquires a company or there's a merger or something to that effect, or, you, or even if it's a, an organization that's just merging business units, is it a sensible use case scenario where somebody deploys it on a laptop and takes it into an environment to map a world as a once-off? Or is that an unlikely use case scenario? Is it more so the case that it's going to be in there and just permanently left and run? It's it's more of a it's more of a this this particular tool is more of a kind of install on a server and it's left there to run. Um, that way you can collect the information you need for it and keep a, a I guess a running inventory of what you have. Um, it's unlike the map tool because the map tool is kind of a run, run it once, get the report that you need, um, and do what you need to do with it today. This one is kind of it's, it's, the nice part about it is the fact that you can kind of tag it, um, give people access to it to kind of check up the state of their, their particular server, the ones that they're interested in. Okay. Um, and probably the last question for me, if I can, and then I'll hand back to Eric uh, for questions that come through the um, Q&A window with the attendees, because we've had a good turnout today. Um, one of my favorite just wrap-ups is uh, what's the process to get your hands on this? I know that you, a lot of your tools are available for try before you buy type things. Uh, where should people go to, to learn more about this online? Uh, whereabouts on the website should they look for the downloads? Uh, and, and what's the journey look like to sort of do a, a proof of concept or a trial and get your hands on it and become familiar with it to then get in touch and, and buy it? Yeah, um, you can go to the igera.com website and you can download a two-week trial um, for free, um, right. and then, and if you like, if you want to reach out to us, we can also schedule a demo um, with our one of our 
engineers to kind of go into do a more deep dive into the tool. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate the time to chat to you about it. And, and I, I, you know, based on my personal experience, and I'm, I'm sure I speak for Robin in this, and on his lifelong experience, I think um, I think it's a given that, that something like this is a requirement nowadays. We, you know, we can't do this manually now, no matter how hard we try. The scale is you know, just too large, and things are moving too quickly. Um, so I highly recommend people do exactly that. Jump on the IDEA website and get a copy to play with. Um, because uh, the, the potential risk from my own experience with the anecdotes I shared just today um, has been that, you know, it can go from very bad to, to very good quickly if you've got the right tools, but it can also go the other way if you don't. So, Eric, back to you. Yeah, just I'll throw one last question over to you. Um, an interesting one. I'm just kind of curious to know what you're seeing out there. You know, the cloud obviously is ever more important these days. Amazon Web Services, but they're not the only ones. Microsoft has its whole Azure offering that seems to be gaining steam. I'm curious to know, one of the attendees is writing that uh, Dr. Plora made an interesting point that DBAs are expensive, and uh, that management problem caused by either a rogue DBA or someone who's not doing what they should be doing, can that be solved by migrating to the cloud? I'm really just curious to know, how much activity are you seeing? Do you see that migrating to the cloud is becoming a bigger issue for businesses, or what's your take on that just as a trend? Um, I I feel like it's um, it just depends on which what kind of industry you're in. I feel like some industry they they say no, we're not migrating. We're um, they may be they may not be migrating to a public cloud. They may be looking at you know migrating or migrating their stuff into a private cloud. Um, and then I see some organizations that are interested and in, you know really are on the fast track to kind of going towards uh, an Amazon or uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, so, yep. and then there are some people that are saying, oh, no, we're, we're not migrating our data, or there's only certain data we would migrate, uh, but not our, not our critical ones. So I think there's kind of three camps of folks. Um, yep, no, that makes sense. I mean, we're seeing that more and more, and I think it's gonna be moving in fits and starts for quite some time. And uh, there is a backlash to the cloud, too. You know, people get into, up into Amazon Web Services. We've heard this more than a few times. And at first, the costs are, are manageable. And then over time, it just creeps up. And then you're kind of stuck there. So you know, in many ways, the cloud is just another data center. But uh, it's going to be an interesting journey going forward, to say the least. Well, folks, we do archive all these webcasts. Uh, hop online to techopedia.com to check out uh, a complete list of all the things that we do. And of course, insideanalysis.com for all the latest. And with that, we're going to bid you farewell. And thank you so much once again for your time and attention. Thanks for all of our friends at IDERA. And we'll talk to you tomorrow, hopefully, for our Philosophy of Data culminating webcast. That's right. Philosophy of Data is tomorrow at 4 o'clock Eastern. Hope to see you there. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.